Design Plans for Two Column Proofs, Lesson 2.6b. I hope you saw 2.6a. If you haven't, it's linked in the description with the other videos from Chapter 2. Sometimes the hardest part of writing a proof is planning the logical steps that will take us from the given statement to the proof statement. It's just like doing a jigsaw puzzle. We can start with any piece. I usually start with the flat edges to make the outline. We write down everything we know from the given statement. If we can't make a connection easily, we can start with the proof statement and work backwards. Then we can connect the pieces into logical order. Our plan is a draft of the major statements and reasons, and it may be shorter than the actual two-column proof. It's just a plan. I have a theorem for you. It's number 2.6.5, and it's the common angles theorem. It says if two angles adjacent to a common angle are congruent, then the overlapping angles formed are congruent. Now this is also called the Common Overlapping Angle Theorem, and it's similar to the Common Segment Theorem that we're going to talk about in the next lesson. So basically what this theorem is saying is, here we've got three angles, we've got four rays, we've got one angle, two angle, three angle, and it's telling us that if we add these two angles together, it will equal these two angles. Angle one plus angle two equals angle two plus angle three. That's what the theorem's telling us. We can prove the common angle theorem by developing a plan. Here we have a given angle AXB, that's this top angle, AXB, is congruent to angle CXD, CXD. We need to prove that AXC, now it includes both angles, is congruent to BXD, now this includes both angles. We start by looking at the difference in the given and the proof statements, and how does AXB compare to AXC? How does angle CXD compare to angle BXD? Well, in both cases, the angle in the middle, angle BXC, is combined with the first angle to get the second angle. And the situation involves combining adjacent angle measures. So we list any definitions, properties, postulates, and theorems that might help us. So the definition of congruent angles can help us. We see a congruent sign here. And the angle addition postulate can help us. We're adding angles, aren't we? And the properties of equality, like the addition property, can help us. And the reflexive, symmetric, or transitive property of congruence can help us. So here's our plan, and it's got some pieces missing. We start with what we're given and what we're trying to prove, and then we work towards the middle. So we have a given. We've got it here. And we've got what we're trying to prove. Here's our proof statement. We've got it at the bottom. And we can say, well, if these are congruent, they're equal, aren't they? Because that's the definition of congruent angles. And that's our reason. It's the definition of congruent angles. We can jump down to number seven again and say, well, these are congruent. We can say that's the definition of congruent angles. But we're missing the pieces in the middle. We can move up from seven and say, the same thing we did up here, if this is congruent, that's equal. If this is congruent, that's equal. But it's not going to be the same reason, okay? And looking at step one, angle BXC is the missing piece in the middle of our flow of logic. We don't have that in there, that little middle angle. We need to write down what we know about angle BXC. Well, angle BXC is congruent to angle BXC. That's the reflexive property of congruence. What it's saying is, because it's being included with these two as an angle, and then it's being included with these as an angle, that it is equal to itself. It's congruent to itself, see? So the measure of angle BXC is equal to the measure of angle BXC. That's the reflexive property of equality. So now we have our third point. We have our third piece. We could put that there, okay? Now we need the angle addition postulate to finish the proof. We learned about this in chapter one, lesson three. If S is in the interior of PQR, so S is in the interior of PQR, then the measure of angle PQS, this top angle, plus SQ, the measure of angle SQR, this bottom angle, is going to equal the measure of the whole thing, PQR, see? So now we have numbers four and five for our two column proof. We've got the measure of angle AXB plus the measure of angle BXC is equal to the measure of angle AXC. That's the angle addition postulate. And 
we've got the measure of angle BXC, remember that's the little angle in the center, plus the measure of angle CXD is going to equal the measure of angle BXD. Okay? I know it's hard because of all these letters, but if you, you can look at the picture as you're doing this, it'll make more sense. Okay? So deductive reasoning goes from generalities to specifics. We go from general statements to specific reasons. We use the pieces to write a complete two-column proof of the common angles theorem. So here we have our drawing again, right here, and we have our given angle AXB is congruent to angle CXD, and we need to prove that angle AXC is congruent to angle BXD. So we have our statements and our reasons. So if you look at our plan, we have number one, number two, and part of number six and number seven, so we filled those in. Then we had number three by figuring out the reflexive property of equality, so we've got it there. We've got number four and five from using the angle addition postulate. So here's number four. It's saying that the measure of angle AXB plus the measure of angle BXC, remember it said this is congruent to this, so the measure of this angle plus this angle equals the measure of this angle plus this angle, okay? That's our angle addition postulate, okay? And we basically reiterate it in number five. So we're saying that these are equal to each other in number four. That's the addition property of equality. Then we're saying the measure of angle AXB plus the measure of angle BXC, that's the two top small ones, is equal to the measure of angle AXC, okay? So it's saying these two angles are equal to this, all right? Then we do it for the other two. We say the measure of angle this CXD plus BXC equals BXD. That's both of them, okay? That's the angle addition postulate. So now we have number six, which we had along from our plan, because we turned that congruent sign into an equal, and our reasoning is the substitution property of equality. Okay, so I know these can be really difficult, but you have to go slow and you can start at the top and then at the bottom and work yourself into the middle. Or sometimes you can just go straight down from the top. It depends on what you're trying to do and it depends on how easy the flow of logic looks. So here's a flow of logic. Our given is that Bitsy is a Pomeranian. Well, she is. She's my dog. She's a Pomeranian. We need to prove that she's a mammal. So we say, well, Bitsy is a Pomeranian. That's our given. We can say a Pomeranian is a dog. That's the definition of a Pomeranian. We can also say a dog is a mammal. That's the definition of a dog. And we can say a Pomeranian is a mammal. We went from a Pomeranian is a dog to a dog is a mammal. So it's like saying Pomeranian is equal to dog. Dog is equal to mammal. So Pomeranian is equal to mammal. That's the transitive property. If a Pomeranian is a dog and a dog is a mammal, then a Pomeranian is a mammal. The transit property says A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay, because they all equal each other. So, Bitsy is a mammal. Because Bitsy is a Pomeranian, we can say if Bitsy is a Pomeranian and a Pomeranian is a dog and a dog is a mammal, then a Pomeranian is a mammal. Then Bitsy is a mammal. See? So, you need logical thinking to just get yourself to the proof and you'll be okay. All right? It might take some practice. Thankfully, most books have partially finished two-column proofs so that you can see how they're getting where they're getting. But it's really important for us to have all our theorems and postulates and definitions and properties all written down in our spiral so that we can go to them quickly to see which one we need to use for our two-column proof. We're going to do flowchart and paragraph proofs next. That's lesson 2.7. I hope this second video helped you figure out these two column proofs. I know a lot of people have trouble with them, but once you stare at them, you start to see the logic of how it flows down to the proof, okay? I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Bye.